Philippine. I'm Dennis Delaney, an extension specialist in the Department of Crop Soil Environmental Sciences at Auburn University. And I'm going to talk a little today about fertilizing cover crops to increase residue and the benefits from it. I want to give a lot of credit to Dr. Kip Balcom uh, at the USDA National Soil Dynamics Lab here in Auburn. Uh, for uh, a lot of this research and, and a lot of the slides that are be presented today are, are coming from him. So appreciate uh, Kip's input. Okay. Uh, what is a cover crop? A lot of people have different uh, definitions. My definition is a crop whose main purpose is to benefit the soil or, or the next crop in one or more ways was not really intended to be harvested for feed or for sale of making a cash crop. Uh, some folks like to, uh, to graze what they call cover crops, but uh, again, that would kind of fall outside the definition of become a forage or, or, or grazing crop. It's also used as cover crop, so kind of a hybrid there. So again, there's all kinds of definitions from all kinds of different people. Uh, we can use all kinds of grasses, legumes, uh, forbs, just a whole lot of different things that we can use as, as cover crops to help improve the soil or benefit the next crop. Some potential benefits uh, from cover crops, of course, you've all heard about those, I'm sure, erosion control, uh, improving the soil and water quality, increased water infiltration, which can be real important at certain times of the year, actually getting this heavy rainfall into the soil uh, particularly in the summertime. Minimize the nutrient loss, the runoff, uh, the particular soil that carries nutrients with it. Uh, nitrogen, if you have legumes out there, can supply free nitrogen to, to the next crop. But that said, in order to, uh, to really get advantage of, of these cover crops, we need to uh, optimize the conditions and maximize the growth of them. Uh, you start out with optimal soil fertility and pH, just like you would any row crop, quality seed, inoculating any legumes with the right inoculant, fresh, make sure it's alive. Plant as early as possible to take advantage of any warm fall weather before it gets cold. Uh, need good stand establishment, just like the, a, a cash crop. And then terminate as late as possible and still be able to establish your cash crop on time. Take advantage of all that money you've already spent and uh, in time in establishing the cover crop uh, to get the maximum benefits from it. Uh, cover crops do need fertility also, just like a cash crop. Uh, there's some differences between legumes and small grains. Usually we can assume that uh, there's adequate PK and soil pH already there for a well-managed cash crop uh, unless a lot of biomass has been removed, in which case you may be removing a lot of potassium in particular, but also uh, phosphorus sometimes in that, uh, in that cash crop, something like this corn silage crop. So uh, if you think it might be a question, it's a good idea to take a soil test. Uh, but on low fertility sites, sites that may be being brought into production, it can be important, uh, particularly uh, phosphorus for legumes. Uh, looking back, the old rotation here in Auburn University campus, in 1896, uh, those sites were relatively low fertility. And one of the set of treatments out there was uh, splitting the, the P and K between the winter legumes and the cotton, half on each of uh, those crops because the phosphorus in particular was so critical uh, to getting good growth out of legumes. So it can be important most of the time it's adequate feed K out there though. Uh, with the legumes, uh, there's a wide variation in the uh, type and of legumes that you can plant, a lot of differences in, in production, uh, but some of them like hairy vetch, uh, estimates for the nitrogen they provide to the next cash crop can be anywhere from 40 to 200 pounds of nitrogen per acre. And that depends just how much growth you have out there, uh, how early you got planted, how good the weather was, how late you wait to kill it, and all those kind of variables in here into it. And that's why there's such a wide range out there of how much nitrogen you can supply. Uh, 
but if there's no need to apply nitrogen and legumes, what about all the others? Uh, the, the grasses, the forbs, uh, Nebraska's, things like that. As you can see, there's a huge difference uh, in this slide between uh, uh, a cereal grain that's had 90 pounds per acre of uh, nitrogen applied to it versus no nitrogen. And you can see with zero nitrogen, very little growth out there uh, as compared to the fertilized. And in a lot of cases, uh, it may be really hard to recover the money that you've already spent on seed if you don't put some fertilizer out to kind of boost it on along. Uh, just makes a huge difference in, in how much mulch you can get, how much soil erosion you can prevent, and how much water infiltration you'll get later in, in the summer season. Uh, my rule of thumb is most of the time you want to have at least two tons per acre of cover crop biomass out there to really make it worthwhile. Uh, you can see this is a slide of some uh, fertilization of cereal rye and with zero nitrogen uh, one year uh, was able to barely make it over two tons per acre adding just 30 pounds of nitrogen per acre uh, tremendously boosted uh, the amount of biomass that was produced and uh, as you kept increasing more nitrogen out there you got more uh, biomass produced and the biggest bang for the buck is that first 30 pounds of nitrogen to really get it going. Uh, after that, you could just keep on increasing the biomass uh, enough to really make a difference and add some mulch and organic matter back to the soil. There are some alternative sources uh, that may be a little cheaper than, than commercial fertilizer, uh, such as poultry litter. Uh, this is a test that Dr. Balcom had uh, conducted several years ago. Uh, looking at timing of applying the nitrogen poultry litter uh, fall versus spring uh, comparing it to commercial nitrogen and it rates 0, 30, 60, and 90 pounds per acre or 1, 2, and 3 tons of litter per acre. Uh, you can see uh, this again this is cereal rye and you can see the, uh, the amount of rye biomass tended to increase the higher the fertility rates, uh, particularly with the uh, commercial fertilizer, but also with the litter kept climbing. But again, the big spang for the buck right there is, is uh, at, at 30 pounds of uh, nitrogen per acre or the first one ton per acre of litter. Uh, again, after that, you can keep increasing it, but, but you really want to make sure that that rye cover crop is not stressed for nitrogen in order to get your, your biggest return from it. As far as timing, uh, between fall applied and spring applied, you know, a lot of times with our, our wheat crops, we put most of our nitrogen out in the spring. But with something like rye, where you're just trying to get the biomass early, get the good growth uh, early, and then have be able to terminate it in time to plant your summer crop, cash crop, uh, fall applied is the best way to go. Uh, again, just to, to get as much biomass as you can, take advantage of that, that warmer winter weather that we tend to have here in the south. Uh, of course, the big question is, is do you get that money back? It's all nice and good to have more cover crop and improve the soil quality, but does it actually increase yield? And this is a set of graphs of, of comparing the cotton lint yield after um, the zero, 30, 60, 90 pounds of commercial nitrogen versus the chicken litter rates. And you can see with uh, no nitrogen side dressed to the cotton that the cover crop does start releasing some of that nitrogen back to the, uh, to the cotton crop and, and will slightly increase yield, especially at the higher rates, but it still takes some nitrogen on the cotton. Uh, the, the top set of lines is 90 pounds per acre of nitrogen in addition to what you put on at the uh, rye cover crop. So it does tend to boost yield. And again, that first 30 pounds per acre, one ton per acre of litter is, is what really gets you that, that boost in yield uh, after boosting the amount of cover crop that's out there. Uh, one thing I was, uh, you know, talking to farmers, I know there's a lot of cost involved between uh, 
getting equipment and the crew out there to plant these cover crops, buying the seed, buying the fertilizer, managing it. There's a lot of that goes into it, a lot of cost. Uh, so you always want to try to manage that to get the maximum amount of benefits from it. Uh, sometimes it's hard to do, but, but again, I think in the long run, having the maximum amount of biomass out there is will really be to the producer's benefit. Uh, this is a, a quote uh, from uh, Dr. Wayne Reeves, who was here a few years ago, that soil carbon and crop residues are, are really the key to making conservation tillage work. It's not really the lack of tillage or no tillage, uh, but the production and conservation of crop residues that offers the most benefit to productivity. So again, if we're planting into a real sparse or real thin unfertilized cover crop, or even uh, just the stalks from the previous year, uh, we may not do a lot to really help build that soil, but if we can make the, the most biomass, the, the best cover crop that we can and leave it out there without uh, destroying it, destroying that organic matter, that'll give us the most uh, benefit to our next cash crop. Uh, and a lot of times it's difficult here in the South, but I think in the long run it'll be worthwhile. Again, uh, I'd just like to thank you for your time and, and uh, that's all I've got. Thank you.